First of all, I'd like to come to Father Mikol Paluk uh, and invite him, uh, invite you, Father, to say something about this important question of solidarity, equality, and social justice. If we were all together, I would be saying to you, you have the floor, but on this occasion, I say to you, you have the microphone and you have the video as well. It's good to see you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation. It's, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to, to, to work with you during this afternoon. And first of all, congratulations on this initiative. Solidarity understood as a set of events, the social movement that started 40 years ago in Poland and understood as a powerful idea of social transformation has a lot of potential that should be better known and explored. I'm happy that the St. John Paul II Institute of Culture at our university takes part in this initiative. My contribution will be divided into two parts. In the first of them, I would like to remind us about how John Paul II, the privileged commentator and to some extent participant of the solidarity movement, attempted to articulate it. In the second part, I will try to identify the biggest challenge for us today in our attempts to put this ideal into practice. We find a definition of solidarity in the encyclical Solicitudo Rei Socialis. We are in 1987, a few years after the beginning of the workers' movement in Poland, and just after the beginning of perestroika in the Soviet Union, but before the Polish Round Table and the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989. Reflecting on interdependence in the contemporary world, the Polish Pope describes a moral and social attitude that should be the right response to it. He calls it solidarity, and he continues in the following way, quote, This then is not the feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of so many people, both near and far. On the contrary, it is a firm and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. That is to say, to the good of all and of each individual, because we are all really responsible for all. It's the number 38. Well, one might be a little bit disappointed by such a description. It stresses firmness in the pursuit of the common good, but it is not very specific. Nevertheless, Let's note its vaulting ambition. Solidarity should take into account the good of all and of each individual because we are all really responsible for all. As you can see, John Paul II thinks about solidarity very inclusively and really in global terms. To have the whole picture of the essential elements of JP2's understanding, I would even like to say project of solidarity, I would like to add one more quote. It will help us to see what was the specific, specifically Christian component that had been added to the workers' social movements by the equivalent Polish movement, Solidarity. In the same year, 1987, during his visit to Poland as the mass organized in Gdańsk, the cradle of the Solidarity movement, John Paul II presented one of the most concise and accessible descriptions of what solidarity is and should be about. By the way, I still remember the sweat on my back as I listened to these words in a big crowd that day. It was a very hot day. Bear one another's burdens. This succinct sentence of St. Paul is an inspiration for interpersonal and social solidarity. Solidarity means one another together. And if a burden is to be borne, it is borne together in, communi in community. It is never one against another or ones against others. It never implies that 
a burden should be borne by a man alone without the help of others. Struggle must not be stronger than solidarity. The program of struggle must not be above the program of solidarity. Otherwise, our two heavy burdens are growing." End quote. In the light of this short, simple, but powerful passage, we can grasp that the Christian touch in the approach to the social question brought in itself the invitation to get out of the logic of the class war and enter into the logic of mutual respect and cooperation. Instead of the us against them, which could have ended up breaking people apart, John Paul II wanted the solidarity that unites across real and valuable differences between workers and employers, uh, even between solidarity movement members and the communist establishment. It might be taken as crazy and impossible going against the first experiences of solidarity in the workers' movement that wanted to solve the social question at the end of the 19th century. But what happened in the Eastern Bloc after those words had been written and pronounced was felt by my generation as a huge encouragement to recognize that this new Christian edition of solidarity is not only a beautiful ideal, but that it may really function. I want to stop the first part of my presentation here. As we can see, the project of solidarity articulated by JP2 on the basis of the Polish experience was understood by him as firmness in the pursuit of the common good. It was inclusive, keeping a place in, the, in this project for all, and non-violent. Well, I hope that we can admit that we need such solidarity everywhere and in every time. It is a dream we share. It would be so beautiful to be able to live such solidarity on all levels of our social fabric, starting in families, our local and professional communities, and going upwards within international relationships. If this is a dream that so many of us share, why is it so difficult today to put this dream into practice? My answer to this question is because of the way we live our identities. What do I mean? Well, it is not enough to have a good ideal. It may be put into practice only if you have the right attitude towards it. Pardon my example, although we remain in the field of imagination of the last quote, bearing burdens. If you want to become a master of weightlifting, you need to know how to approach weight. If you don't, you will break your backbone in the first training session. My apprehension is that unfortunately, we are losing the right attitude towards different burdens, challenges that we should confront in the world today. And as a result of that, we are starting to have severe problems with the backbones of our common projects. Let me remain with John Paul II as our main guide through the problems we have with solidarity today in order to explain what I mean. If you look at the way he proposed to us to live our identity, you see a man attempting to create a warm and respectful place for others, reaching out to the people who do not share the Christian faith and convictions. As you probably remember, he was the first Pope who organized a meeting for the leaders of the world's religions and who paid a visit to a synagogue and a mosque. He was the first Pope to ask for forgiveness for the sins that Catholics had committed during the past centuries. Well, it is important to notice that all this happened because of the strong identity he, he espoused. Strong Christian identity was not an obstacle in the way of those historic gestures, but their necessary basis. In a world imbued with different postmodern narratives, 
we seem to believe more and more that the only way to create a warm space for others is through weakening our own, own identities. In other words, we will be able to become respectful of others, not because of who we are, but only in spite of who we are. And we think this is, and we think this is especially so when it comes to the case of religious identities. But this is an illusion. The man produced by our postmodern ideologies, a uh, man without qualities, if I may use the title of a prophetic work by Robert Musil, is not able to create any warm places around himself. He's more and more self-centered and focused on experiments with his, its identity without any real interest in others. And without the social energy to create warm places for others, any project of solidarity has no necessary foothold in order to be set up and to flourish. Thus, the claim I would like to make in the second part of my contribution is the following. Without our capacity to live our identity fully, taking into account its religious aspect, we will not be able to have the necessary social energy to maintain our big social projects focused on social justice and on reducing inequalities in our societies. Such projects may last for a while out of inertia, maintained on the basis of a sense of post-colonial or post-World War II guilt, but if they, have lost, if they have lost their footholds in the depths of a self-confident identity, sooner or later, such great and noble projects are nevertheless condemned to expire. Thank you for your attention. Father Michal, thank you very much indeed for that very thoughtful and thought-provoking intervention. I wonder if I might pick up on just one or two things to tease them out a little bit, though you spoke with great clarity. The first question, I suppose, that came to my mind was this question of the identity or well-being of the individual as over against that of the community. Um, you mentioned this when you were speaking about solidarity and when you were speaking about how we approach this question. And it does seem to me that this is a quite major issue. It's a major issue often within the church, but it's a big issue within society and, and geopolitics. Those societies which hold the well-being of the community as the primary issue and others which hold the well-being of the individual. I wonder if you can say a little bit more about that dilemma, if dilemma it is, when we approach the question of solidarity. Well, I would say that uh, the church and what's more the christian theology has extraordinary resources to address this problem because of uh, our thinking about god one in a community and one and community at the same time so i would say that to some extent it is, I'm, I'm starting very, very high, as, as you understand, but, but, but I think that, that, that really it's, it's, it's of relevance for, for, for the whole issue. I think that, that uh, this model of thinking about God gives you the, the, the main resources to think about uh, uh, the individualistic part of our identity and the, uh, the community part of our identity. As, as recons reconciled and, and, and understand that if we leave some tensions, you know, in, in the world, it's quite obvious, especially uh, taking into account the postmodern uh, uh, way of thinking, I, I think that, that, that uh, it's, it's a change that, that might be overcome 
thanks thanks of the resources and and experiences we have we have we have in the past as as uh, as well so i would say you should you should well i i don't want you know to to bring you too much in this direction but don't uh, let's think about you know the structure and uh, and the dynamic of of the eucharist which is <laughs> which is which is for for one one on on, on the, to, to some extent and and for the community as well and and one without community doesn't exist and the community without this one doesn't doesn't exist so so i would say there is a lot of reflection inside of the christian theology and 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 of the church which may be understood as as as, as the resources you know to 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 see how to overcome uh, this huge challenge today thank you very much indeed and, and i suppose on on one understanding of the nature of the trinity as well one is thinking about that which is one and that which is more than one uh, at the same time so uh, yes there, there's much to be explored i think there well i'd like to come next to uh, dr Avery, dr austin Avery, and uh, those of you who haven't known his name before now will surely know his name from this book which uh, he uh, produced along with uh, pope francis let us dream the path to a better future. And of course, uh, we are hoping very much that solidarity is part of that path to a, be a better future. It is, for those of you who haven't read it, well worth reading. And from my experience of it, well worth reading the whole way through, because I think there's a development of thinking, uh, which I find uh, very interesting indeed. But uh, we're not there to focus on the book, excellent though it is, and I'm sure he will have some things to say about it. But Austin, we come to you now and invite you to make your intervention. Thanks very much, John. Thank you for the chance to be with you today and to talk, if I may, mainly about Pope Francis's insights uh, in Let Us Dream. Forgive me if after speaking to you, uh, I, I have to leave, I'm afraid. I won't be part of the discussion uh, for, uh, for, for important family reasons, which I wasn't aware of when I took the invitation. But, um, but I'll ha I have 10 minutes now just to talk about what I think is Francis's vision for, uh, for solidarity, for fraternity, as I think he would also say uh, at this moment. Now, th this book, Let Us Dream, is the first book ever written by a pope in response to a specific crisis, the crisis that we're now going through, the COVID crisis. Um, and of course, Francis is not alone in saying that we will be different after this crisis. He is not alone in also saying that he hopes that we have a better world after this crisis, that this crisis becomes an opportunity for a rethink or a reset. He's not the only one saying that. Everybody is. But I think he's probably the only leader on the world stage right now who understands the process of conversion that is implied in a crisis. Now, what, what I mean by that is that for Francis, and remember, he is above all, he has insights about politics, about society, about economics, but he's above all a spiritual leader. His concern is to how we allow God into our story and into history, and specifically how God can enter into this crisis. So his concern, to put this theologically, is how we open ourselves to the graces that are on offer at this time from a loving, merciful God who always accompanies us especially in times of tribulation and conversely what are the obstacles and the temptations which prevent us from receiving those graces or to put another way how is it in a very secular way how is it that some crises change us for the better and others frankly change us for the worse or we don't learn from and th there's a there's a challenge at the heart of this book which is to say that the crisis will only can only change us we will only be left better or worse those are really the only two options um and you know looking back on history one can see that that is true so my invitation when when i first got in touch with him to to suggest this book uh, was that he would help to teach us uh, how we can change, how we can allow ourselves to change through this crisis. So the book is constructed on a three-part, very familiar dynamic, familiar that is, if you know the Latin American church, see, judge, act, or as Francis would prefer to say, contemplate, discern, propose, which is the dynamic, the very pattern of conversion, that we must begin by seeing, and the seeing is what we see and how we see is important. In a crisis, it's easy to go back in on ourselves 
to seek to distraction, to seek uh, to go back to where we were, or simply to batten down the hatches and wait for the storm to pass. All of those are ways of avoiding the graces on offer. So what he's inviting us to do is to see what this crisis has revealed. And we begin by looking at the margins. We look at places of pain and suffering, like Jesus going through uh, Galilee, going to places on the edges of the world, uh, because that's f f it is from there that we see the world better. And it is to allow ourselves to see uh, the pain and the suffering and to allow that to affect us, to, be, to move us, to open our hearts and minds. And in doing so, of course, we're overwhelmed by the challenges that we are faced. And I mean, it's obvious, and he talks about this, if we look at this crisis, what has it revealed about our health system, about the way we treat our elderly people, uh, about who is important in our society? I mean, we know we're all very familiar with those lessons because we've been living with them this last year. But the point is that, are we able to look at that and say, well, actually, is this telling us how we organize ourselves? and how we should be organizing ourselves. So the seeing the reality is really important. And then the second part, the choosing, the discerning, because what is revealed in a crisis is where our values really lie, what is really important to us. And it's in, uh, it's in the, as he says right at the beginning, a crisis is a time of testing, it's a time of sifting, to use that very biblical word, uh, a time when our hearts are tested. And of course, we've seen this in our governments in the way they've responded to the crisis. We've seen it in, in leaders, in institutions, where, frankly, faced with this crisis, where have they put their priorities? And in that, we reveal, therefore, where the spirit of God is, the spirit of good is, the spirit of fraternity, and where is the spirit of selfishness, of denial, and so on. And the clarity that comes with a crisis is where Francis puts his hope <laughs> because it is in seeing things more clearly that we're then able to determine how we should build back better, to use that rather hackneyed phrase. So um, I, I don't wanna, I can't in a few minutes, you know, summarize Francis's take on this, just to invite you as John did to, to read the book um, and to allow yourself to be carried on by that. But just to end with, with the, the third part, which is called a time to act where Francis takes this discernment and he takes everything we've learned in this crisis. And he says, are we now willing to build a society based not on the mythological idea of individual sovereignty, but rather on the principle of fraternity, the, the principle of solidarity to which we're speaking uh, today? And if we do that, what does that look like? And one of the big and important messages from the third part is that we need a different kind of economy in which gives access to work and gives access to the goods of the earth, to everybody, while at the same time protecting the planet. That's a very different kind of economy, that, which is one based on perpetual growth uh, and on maximization and so on. And of course, if, that, if we do that, then we need a different kind of politics to set different goals for the economy. And the kind of politics we need is neither liberal technocracy nor populism, which exploits popular anguish as a means of power, but rather a politics which involves a genuine protagonism of the people. And it's interesting that we began today by remembering uh, St. John Paul uh, II and the Solidarity Movement in Poland, because that was a great example of what Francis was calls in Spanish, a movimiento popular, a popular movement, a movement of the people, which arises from the margins, that arises from, you know, from ordinary people who organize. And why do they organize and how do they organize? Because they have a sense of their own dignity. And the sense of that dignity arises, which was such a great theme for St. John Paul II, that dignity which arises from the encounter with a merciful God. And it is that encounter, that, that understanding, that awareness that is triggered by that encounter that awakens in us you know, the sense of our dignity being on the one hand uh, not respected and on the other hand that leads us to unite with others to seek to express that dignity. So his, his, his rather beautiful and startling thesis if I can call it that, at the end of the book, is that our, what our crisis reveals is the loss of the sense of dignity of the people. And it is in the recovering of the sense of the dignity of the people that we will be able to create a better world, a world which is based around and centered on 
fraternity, on solidarity, on justice. Uh, and we, we do that because once we put the dignity of the human person at the center, when it becomes the organizing principle of our politics and economics and society, things begin to look uh, a bit different. So he ends in a very kind of practical way talking about land, labor and lodging, which would be, if you like, the three fundamentals that people need to, to thrive and survive. Land, not in the sense necessarily of physical property, but if you like, of ownership of, of, of goods. And labor above all, I mean, work is, the, is one of the big themes at the moment. We live in a precariat. We've gone from a proletariat to a precariat where you know, work has become uh, insecure. People are deeply anxious. Um, how, can we, how can we create that different kind of economy and that different kind of uh, uh, organization uh, based on fraternity? And so that's the invitation of the book. So it's an invitation for us not to lose the opportunity of this crisis. Uh, not to miss out on the graces that are on offer to us uh, at this time. Uh, very little faith in current structures, very little faith in contemporary politics, but enormous faith and enormous hope in the stirring of the movement of dignity from the margins, which he sees in you know, all kinds of things, you know, Black Lives Matter movement or, or, or indeed clerical sex abuse victims, or you know, there are all these different signs that we know that dignity uh, and we're seeking something better. So it ends on that, I think, very hopeful note and an invitation to us all to, to transcend ourselves, to decenter ourselves, to go out in service of others, as me, Father Mikhail said, you know, to bear the burdens of others uh, and that have that culture of service. This is the kairos, the opportunity of this moment, which he's inviting us to embrace. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Austin. And uh, you've been able to to pull together in a very concise um, but helpful way um, the themes of the book and how they are relevant to our conversation today. And of course, this question of crisis uh, is, is really quite profound. I was just reflecting not very long ago that when we read the history of the, the 20s and 30s and what happened in Europe, there's a great deal said about the impact of the First World War and the, what happened then. And then very little said about the impact of the 1918 to 1920. Of Spanish flu, absolutely. But those of us who are living through this at the moment are so overwhelmed with the pandemic that it's hard to believe the 1918-1920 flu pandemic did not have an enormous impact uh, on what happened globally in the 20s and, and, and 30s after that. So, as you say, um, the, the, the pandemic has not so much created things as exposed and to some degree exacerbated uh, the problems that are already there and, and, and have been there. Um, I suppose there were two thoughts that were around in my mind which you may wish to respond to and the second one in particular I think we're going to come to, to Sally to, to respond. The first one is that uh, 40 years on um, we, we have this enormous event in Poland and it ricocheted right around the world and important things happen. And yet, when we go 40 years on, kind of two generations roughly, it's, it's as though the whole thing is not quite consolidated by down to where it was, but nevertheless, the, a lot of the inspiration and the vibrancy and the passion seems to have gone out of it. And, uh, and of course, this is, this is part of the human condition. It's as though, you know, a, a generation arises which are impelled to do something, change things dramatically, um, sometimes in a revolutionary way, although that could turn out really rather badly, but certainly to create new change and so on. Then the next generation starts making rules about it. And then the generation after that starts saying, well, yes, and then there are all these people who break the rules and we've got to do something about that. And the whole thing becomes about regulation and legislation and the spirit seems to kind of go out of it. So I, I guess the first question that, that, I, that I would have is something about this dilemma that, that seems to be almost part of our condition, that uh, we, we have the inspiration uh, and then it seems to shrink back down into something that's much smaller than that. Um, and, 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 I think, and I think that's true of, our, of all of our lives, isn't it? I mean, there are periods in, in our lives where we, have, where we are profoundly... Um, I suppose, aware of our dependence on others uh, and indeed on God. Um, and there are other periods where we turn in on ourselves. We believe that we're in charge of our own 
destiny and we grow cold and we grow selfish and and you know we all know that you know, the rapid economic growth and, and, and materialism which is often also a lack of material goods in others anxiety about material goods drives out those other things um, which which enable us to build a better society. So I think I think um, you're right. I mean, <laughs> there's nothing new under the sun. I mean, that's why we have Lent every year, right? Is to try and recover. I mean, Francis is great. You know, three great encyclicals. Uh, I, I think will always be considered Evangelii Gaudium, uh, Laudato Si, and Fratelli Tutti. And uh, these are three encyclicals concerned with the three core relationships of human beings with 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 our Creator with the created world and with our fellow creatures. So that's that, that, if you like, three elements. Now those ties, those bonds, uh, which make us who we are, which give us our dignity, if you like, <clears throat> constantly need regeneration because they can grow cold because we turn in on ourselves. And a, that's why a crisis, you know, crises are not new and crises in our life. I mean, he draws a lot of analogies in the book, I think very helpfully, between what he calls his personal COVIDs in his own life and indeed the biblical covids you know what king david went through or what saint paul went through you know crises are wonderful moments for resetting because they allow us they break with all the things that we've come to rely on we can no longer rely on and in no, in feeling helpless and powerless we then turn back we turn to god often because we have no, nowhere else to turn. And then we open ourselves to the grace and the mercy that is, and the strength and the vision and the, and the new thinking uh, that that enables, which then allows us to open out to others. So yeah, it's, it's, it's cyclical, it's spiritual, it's in constant need uh, of renewal and regeneration. We're definitely at the moment, I think, um, living through one of those moments of, of turning uh, and it's going to be fascinating to see where we are in five or ten years' time. Well, we're, we're going to be losing you shortly, but there's a, a second question I wanted to put to you, which really, I think, uh, though I don't know exactly what Tali's going to say, but I think leads a little bit into some of the territory of her interest. And that is, as I was reading the book, I, 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 to be honest, I started getting a bit impatient with it, because there was a lot of talk about the importance of the role of women, for mm -hmm. example, other things as well, but that particular example. And, and here I am, you know, I'm a Protestant from a Presbyterian church background, and I'm getting impatient. And I'm saying, what are you talking about? The role of women? Look at the Catholic Church. Look at all the kinds of ways it's behaved and still yeah. does and so forth. And then as you get later in the book, you begin to, and I must confess, when Fratelli Tutti came out, I was saying to myself, why isn't it Fratelli e Sorelle Tutti? No, yes. why isn't it brothers and sisters? And, and then as I get later on in the book, and he begins to say, well, now I've appointed this woman to this position where she has a vote along with the cardinals and bishops. And even starts to use she on a number of occasions where you might have thought he might have used he just in, in the phraseology. And I got the sense, and, and yes, he says it in a, in a couple of places, you know, it, it, it's time is an issue here. Can't change things that quickly. Got to try to bring people along with you. I, I, I absolutely come coming from Ireland and Irish history and knowing you can't rush some things are absolutely true. But isn't there this dilemma about the, 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 the crisis which is sudden yeah. and how do you take things forward when time is involved? Right. Okay, that's, okay. this is a very big question. I'll try and keep it short. Just sorry to be a, a kind of linguistic pedant, but fratelli in Italian includes... Both. In other words, in, in Italian, you say quanti fratelli hai means how many brothers and sisters you have. And so fratelli, and the very first line of fratelli tutti is addressed to brothers and sisters. So I, you know, that, but that's an argument we, we got into at the time. Um, look, I think on, on women in, in Letters Dream, he's fascinating because he's saying we need the leadership of women and we need, and yes. this crisis has revealed the, the importance of the distinctive leadership of, of women. And he says, look at the, the leaders at the moment of countries and the way they've responded to the pandemic. Some of the best responses have been you know, countries led by women. So, so it's very interesting kind of space he's opening up. This is not classical feminism where, where it's about power. He's actually saying that women's leadership needs to challenge uh, you know, in the case of the church, clerical male leadership. And we need that challenge because we need to change. 
And it's not just about simply incorporating women into, into positions of power, because then often women lose that power to challenge us. So I think it's, a new, it's an interesting and nuanced uh, a, a position that he's carving out. And I think within the debates in the church, you see, I mean, you know, uh, the problem is that there never has been a female priesthood in the church, right? And therefore, for there to be, there would have to be, you know, ecumenical council. I mean, we're talking about... A, so the problem is that because of the impossibility of easily changing on that issue, we have an argument in our church, which often goes between the progressives or the feminists who might say, to use a crude word, who say, until the church ordains women, I can't take the church seriously on gender equality. And on the other hand, you have a kind of traditionalists who say, you know, it's all carved in stone and, you know, Jesus chose you. And that, whereas he's opening up a very different space saying, actually, uh, we need women leaders and we have women leaders. You know, some of the mm -hmm. biggest organizations in the church are run by women. In Amazonia, you have entire church communities being, you know, uh, uh, why don't we recognize that those women as leaders? Is it, and if it's because they're not priests, then isn't that clericalism? So I, I, I think it's an interesting space. I don't expect him to in any way satisfy people outside the church who say, well, look, you know, why doesn't he just ordain priests? Uh, but I think f within within the Catholic Church, I think it's a very important and interesting space he's opening up. Yeah, I, I quite agree. And as I say, I, I, as I, as I, I, that's why I said right at the very beginning of our session today, read the book, but read it right through to the end, because I think he, de <laughs> excuse me, he develops the argument. I, I mean, I, I come from a tradition which is actually moving the opposite direction. We've had women elders and women ordained ministers in the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, elders since the 1920s ministers since the early 1970s and now we're finding people want to turn that back so is it there's a it's, it's a fascinating business well you can see why that leads me on to sally uh, and, and uh, not, I'm, with you, sally, I'm so sorry not to hear the rest of it but well, um, i've enjoyed good to see you and let's hope we get back together again in oxford before before too long we hope. that would be lovely john thanks sally sally let's come to you uh, professor sally schultz from uh, Villanova university in the united states and what, what's your response? How do you react, uh, both to the things you've already heard, but, but most particularly to uh, the, the theme of today's webinar? You're very welcome. Lovely to see you, and thanks for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's such an honor to be uh, included, and, and I want to thank you and, and uh, thank uh, Eva Grossman uh, as well for all of uh, the work organizing this event. I think the topic is incredibly important and, and so timely. Um, and I, I, I'm delighted to hear uh, Austin's various remarks. And um, you know, part of what I do as a philosopher is to look at, at, the, at the concepts and the values that they uh, invoke and how these, these ideas can kind of come together and in some sense conspire together to, to transform each other. And uh, one of the things that I see Pope Francis doing in uh, Fratelli Tutti and in, in, in the book is transforming the concept or the idea of uh, solidarity even in Catholic social thought. It is, of course, still a piece with the tradition and uh, uh, it's a very rich tradition, but he is doing something different as well. And so I'd, I'd like to just sort of raise three different points where I see something um, interesting going on there. And the first is um, to, to look at how uh, solidarity challenges equality or what we might think of as, as equity. And um, when you see, when solidarity is prepared with equality, it forces us to see uh, the, what we can think of as the transitive qualities of, uh, of equality. And by uh, transitive properties there, I mean that equality in one sphere does not ensure equality in another, or, or you could think of it the opposite way. Inequality in one sphere is going to adversely uh, impact um, one's uh, capacities in, in other spheres. So, but solidarity, especially uh, solidarity in the Catholic social tradition, is concerned not just with a single sphere, not with, for instance, just distribution of material uh, goods. It, it is concerned with social justice. And uh, it, uh, within that Catholic social teaching tradition, solidarity is, is often, maybe even we could say usually, paired with subsidiarity. The two together work to uh, bring out different communities and there are different communities within which we can take leadership roles. So when you brought up the, the uh, point about women in, in leadership in the church, I think um, one of the things in the, in the book that the Pope is, is doing is drawing attention to the, the importance of those communities and how 
paying attention to solidarity and subsidiarity actually shifts our focus. It's not to say that the hierarchy is unimportant or by any means, but it is to say that we can, within our own communities, within our own spheres of um, uh, uh, spheres of operation, however you want to say, spheres of life, we make a difference. And, uh, and we take up leadership roles. We also, within those communities, foster solidarity within and across. And that's the transitive property. Um, it, it forces us to look at how our leadership within our own communities affects and impacts uh, the ability of other communities, other peoples to participate. So transforming it in this way, um, I, I think you can see that active in, for instance, uh, social justice movements, um, individuals uniting for a common cause to end injustice, oppression, or tyranny of any sort find their collective commitment uh, or find within their collective commitment the impetus to see beyond the single injustice and to identify the structures of injustice and to connect the dots, as it were, between the harms experienced um, by those who suffer injustice. Rather than merely seeking equality within one single um, arena, like the political arena, then solidarity encourages actors to understand and to demand the need for equity across different spheres of social existence. Um, to realize that inequality in one sphere affects uh, standing or, or capacity in another. And I think we can see this very clearly in the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, for instance. The uh, activists have recognized the effects of advocacy against police brutality on um, other things like, for instance, access to education. So a second uh, and related way that solidarity um, is transformed and transforms um, equity is that solidarity makes uh, equity inclusive. And, and Austin and um, Father uh, Pollock both mentioned this and it's come up in previous uh, uh, sessions of this seminar as well. There are certainly forms of solidarity that rely on an in-group and an out-group, um, but I would argue that those are, are dangerous forms of solidarity, right? They're um, defining themselves in opposition to another. And I, I think that's contrary, certainly it's contrary to the Catholic social teaching version of solidarity, but it's, I think it's contrary to the, the principle of solidarity more generally as well. Um, solidarity uh, asks us to allow for connection across difference and to meet our disagreements with respect and dignity, uh, and even uh, to welcome and encourage the diverse and pluralistic views and experiences uh, that each of us brings. And, and I might add here, connecting it to the transitive, that our diversity is important within each of the subsidiary communities within which we're involved. In Catholic social teaching, the phrase uh, is used that we are one human family. But of course, families are messy. And uh, we disagree and we argue. But we also see the value in our connection and in our bond. Um, and, I'll, and I'll mention briefly here, just uh, because you brought it up, um, John, the, that there are times when um, for the good of the family, we have to think about how to restructure. And violence is one of those moments. Um, if violence is entered into the family, it cuts off the ability to connect, to create bonds of solidarity. So um, I, I argue that solidarity cannot uh, accommodate violence. Um, and certainly, uh, I think that's consistent with a, a Catholic social uh, teaching approach. And notice, too, um, that uh, inclusive solidarity is intergenerational. And uh, Pope Francis certainly highlights this in, uh, in both Fratelli Tutti and, and in the book. Movements for social justice have long used the language of creating a better world for our children. They've also understood the need to teach children to care about justice, to teach the practices, culture, customs, and language of solidarity. In other words, intergenerational solidarity, it's not just thinking about the decisions, how our decisions affect future generations, it's also thinking about how we can foster in them the habit of justice or the habit of social change, recognizing that social justice is a long process and that we uh, have to, to foster it and develop it and, and encourage it. We learn the language, we pass it on, okay? Um, uh, let's see, in addition, I think uh, part of that intergenerational solidarity is, is encouraging or, or teaching our children uh, that they are human 
that they are worthy of respect and dignity. That's what, as, um, as the previous speakers noted, that's what inspires the movement. But um, all too often, the, the world of social media or um, uh, other dangerous influences uh, cut us off from our ability to even see ourselves as worthy of dignity. And so we need to, to teach our children uh, that and, and create that as part of our patterns of solidarity. And then um, finally, I would say that uh, uh, solidarity itself also transforms, or rather, uh, let me flip that, equity also transforms solidarity. One way to think of solidarity is as a willingness to share the risks that comes with social uh, relations, uh, to use the language used earlier, to carry each other's burdens. Most of the risks in our social context are willingly accepted, given the understanding that social existence itself lessens overall risks, that we're better off together uh, than we are alone when facing threats of all kinds to our well-being. But shared social risk and solidarity means that participants accept that their actions, that our actions, put ourselves um, and our fellow actors at potentially increased risks. Risks that could harm our material, physical, or uh, social well-being. Equitably sharing social risk requires a, uh, that we create reciprocal relations. The points to emphasize our interconnectedness. In order to do that, we need to be aware of the different social risks that solidaristic actors take. The risks we take uh, to be together in a society can exacerbate vulnerabilities and cause unintentional harm. If they are not shared equitably, trust is eroded. And I think you see this um, tremendously in the pandemic, where we allowed certain members of our social whole to carry a, a heavier burden uh, and, and failed to take up our own uh, positions of leadership within our communities or uh, to take responsibility for our own um, role in offsetting those risks or offsetting those burdens. But the idea of solidarity is that no one person or one entity should carry so much risk that they are made vulnerable because of it. So equity transforms solidarity. It forces us to think about the risks we take together and their effects on the most vulnerable, to pay attention to those relationships of trust. It requires we examine our own social position that we know uh, and what we know and what others know and what we can learn from others and what leadership positions we can take uh, and allow others to take in our solidarity. So equity paired with solidarity emphasizes a sort of reflexive aspect of solidarity. Our actions are not just about a common cause, but that cause is reflected in the relations we have with one another. So those are just three things um, that I see emerging uh, in the, this conjunction of solidarity and equity. And when they're brought together in this way, solidarity pushes equity to be transitive and inclusive. Equity pushes solidarity to be reflexive. And of course, um, we can look to social movements for, uh, for, for guidance on the practice of this and um, for, for insight on when it works and when it doesn't. Of course, um, I'll just end by saying that we are humans and humans are fallible. And, uh, and part of, of recognizing our solidarity and our, uh, our equity is to also recognize when we fail and to take responsibility for those failures, uh, to learn from them and to, to recover, but also to recognize that in our failures, we might need to offset that risk a little bit. To, to lift the burdens of others at, for a time while they reset and recommit to the solidarity we have together. So those are just some initial thoughts. Thank you very much in, indeed, Sally. And we're going to come now to uh, Professor Thomas Giro. But just before we do, w one thing I wanted to, to pick up with you very briefly, if I may. Uh, you talked about the intergenerational solidarity. Yeah. And, and one of the things that I sometimes feel, and perhaps I feel it increasingly as my beard gets more and more white, is that intergenerational solidarity is often interpreted as the current generation thinking about the welfare of the next generation. Yes. But of course, it's not a one-way traffic. At least I hope it's not a one-way right. traffic. And, and, and maybe if you say a little bit about that, and, and I guess it's, you know, it's quite striking, both with John Paul II and with Francis, they are people who are of an age, and yet can appeal to people who are younger and older. So very good examples in that kind of way. 
But of course, there's also this dilemma in the pandemic that you know the older people are, are, are particularly vulnerable, although as they get vaccinated, it looks like younger people are now becoming a larger component of the intensive care units. So, so it's a complex business. But I, I want to just give you a brief comment about that question of but intergenerational solidarity. Yes, good. Well, I'm so delighted that you that you pointed out that it has to be. What did you use? Two way two way street. Yes. <laughs> like that. Yes, because um, uh, you know one of the things uh, that is often overlooked, uh, and this is why I brought in subsidiarity too, which I think is such a powerful concept, um, and and perhaps too often uh, siloed to certain aspects of um, of our social uh, theory uh, theorizing. But um, in reality, a subsidiarity can be employed or, or helpfully thought through in uh, thinking about these relations of intergenerational uh, solidarity as well. Part of what subsidiarity does is to allow us to, to, to as I said, take that leadership roles in um, our certain communities of interest. And uh, young people have something important to, to give, to share, to, that, that we um, can learn from. All too often, uh, we think of ourselves, and I even said it in my comments, uh, as passing on our wisdom, our customs, our, our language of, of social change. But in fact, um, if you look at some of the social movements uh, present in Black Lives Matter uh, is, is a really good one, but, um, but so is, so is uh, uh, some of the, the movements to end sexual violence. The, it's the young people who are pushing uh, uh, the, the agenda and pushing a, a social transformation, um, and they're doing it in a creative way. Now, um, one of those ways is, uh, is social media. And I actually think that, that social media uh, works against solidarity rather than helps to build it. But, um, but what they're doing with the social media, I think is important. They're sharing their narratives. And by sharing our stories, um, I think we create the space for that uh, inclusive solidarity that can span the generations and, and work through time. But we have to be equipped to, to hear the stories and, and equipped to share them. That, the, that um, young people are using social media to share them means that I need to adapt and, and uh, uh, figure out uh, you know, where, where I can enter in in a helpful way. Um, but it probably also means being, at least for a time, a passive listener while I um, accept and learn. Uh, from others. So. Thank you very much indeed, Sally. Professor Sally Schultz, thank you very much. And now we come to Professor Tomasz Giro, um, a, a good friend now to uh, this whole webinar series, uh, uh, as is uh, political theology, which he, he represents, um, and from the University of Warsaw. Professor Giro, it's a pleasure to see you. Uh, you have the mic and you have the video, and we look yeah. forward to what you have to say. Finally, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Lord Alderdeis. Uh, of course, first of all, I'd like to thank organize, organ, organizers for inviting me to the debate. I appreciate very much uh, such an initiative that offers a space, if it is uh, cyberspace, not only to consider the solidarity means, but also to reinvigorate the idea of solidarity. For some understandable uh, reasons, I start with some remarks concerning solidarity both as a social movement, as the, the idea, the solidarity with a capital letter. Uh, the John Paul's uh, uh, sec sec uh, two pontificates swept across, swept across Poland with a wave of awakening. It brought about uh, but both a refreshed feeling for freedom but a strive for liberty. Uh, 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 I didn't say that my remarks are divided into parts. First of all, is about the relationship between solidarity and equality. And uh, according to the Polish experience of solidarity, the second part is about the, the contemporary generation answer, uh, which is a, a completely uh, its face is completely uh, with completely different facets, I, I would say. The year of uh, 1989 was, as Krishna, Krishan Kumar put it, the Annus Mirabilis. Emphatically speaking, the solidarity political victory can be perceived as a completion of the Atlantic Revolution, 
that once so aptly described Robert Palmer. The rise of solidarity movement will justify analogy to other momentous events which raise successive waves of democratization. The American Revolution War and the French Revolution abolished absolutism, solidarity disposed of communism. True political mechanisms were, however, obscure, obscured by the euphoria that the uh, disintegration of the bipolar world order had generated. At the same time, a revolution, or put, to put it in, uh, uh, <clears throat> in Timothy Ash's uh, vocabulary, revolution, half reform, half revolution, brought forth East Europeans a staggering experience of the human ability to begin again. Similar to that, to that described so masterfully by Hannah Arendt in her study on revolution. So you can connect this, this experience to begin again uh, in, in the contemporary context of, of the crisis, social and political crisis resulted by the, by the epidemic. The Atlantic revolutions can now say triumph of the Enlightenment project and seduce the minds of many. Communists strive for implanting a doubtful version of modernization, which however grew out of the Enlightenment's premises. They pretended to be harbingers of the new era. On the other hand, they perceived themselves as a heralding at the end of history. There's a kind of paradox in such assertions. The communist ideology stated a dialectical and logical conclusion of modernity. Consequently, the end of communist posed questions regarding the Enlightenment heritage. In 1980-81, uh, uh, during the first phase of the Solidarity Movement, this is the Polish workers who were to inflict the very blow, I would say, straight to the heart, to the communist ideology. Their resistance to the communist regime demythologized and demystified the historical dialectics. Thanks to the solidarity movement, the working class ceased to be the avant-garde that paved a road toward communism. A core of the Marxist ideology was crushed. Marxists started to languish in its charm and appeal. The poverty of such a form of historicism became obvious. For many, Western thinkers, it was a heartbreaking experience. The solidarity movement was a point of the path to transfer the revolutionary hopes to other social forces. For a time being dis disillusioned, they began to relentless uh, quest, relentless quest that never stops until these days. Uh, I I could offer some some pump uh, some some sample of. Uh, such uh, uh, such theories, uh, beginning from Soros followers through uh, right uh, hope about students and youth generally, Michel Foucault's uh, admirers that opted for, and so on and so on. It's very interesting that, that um, uh, Donna Haraway in the Cyborg Manifest postulates that it's good to join women's forces with cyborgs. Even this brief, uh, Overview shows conclusively that solidarity with the other is feasible under one condition. Liberation necessitates an emphasis upon particularity, which is quite opposite, uh, uh, which is quite opposite to the, uh, the question to the problem of solidarity offered by John Paul uh, II. What's more interesting in that movement originated by John Paul's uh, two reflection on solidarity that found its place in catechism of the Catholic Church. Social justice uh, is tightly linked to common good and political power. Uh, number 1928, uh, this kind of reflection culminated not only the idea of solidarity, but uh, of course uh, also the uh, experience of the collective movement named solidarity. So equality is in, in essential, essential relationship with human dignity and person's rights. A rule not to discriminate doesn't mean to equalize difference. Talents, virtues are unequally apportioned. 
the original idea for solidarity was universal, metaphorically situating beyond clash of political ideological orientations. It had a huge potential to emancipate, but not in a narrow sense formulated by any progressives in their liberating projects. It frames a completely opposite concept for them, teaches to co how to cooperate, not to fight. It is based upon caritas and dilexia proximi, recalling some tenets of political anthropology, whereby the other is a person. Before scholars from Stanford University, University began to conceptualize the question of dignity as the democracy's third core value, this value animated the Polish revolt against the so-called free law and socialism. In a basic sense, solidarity is to deliver a condition for just social order, uh, providing the Lebensfeld, the sphere of life, spheres of life uh, to live her or his life in a dignified manner. The, uh, the idea, idea of solidarity might have shaken the world. One anarchist claimed that dynamite is a great uh, equalizer. For sure, solidarity as the, the idea in social movement consisted even in the international domain a dynamite message. It brought forth a non-violent proposition to universal emancipation. And equity or social justice leads to a conception of good society and good life. Um, now, uh, here I could tell us a long story about uh, the, the fate of the, of the concept, which uh, have uh, very, very uh, serious consequences, but uh, I only point out to, to some of them. First of all, uh, uh, after the illusory victory of solidarity, several advisors, lobbyists, constitutionalists, businessmen, spies swarm Poland to teach us democratic values and free market benefits. Centuries of the Republican, Republican political culture of Polish Commonwealth notwithstanding. Uh, the new liberal order set into motion so-called economic and social transition. As a consequence of it, Polish workers and Polish intelligentsia, uh, the only social hindrances to accrued appropriation were denigrated. Those who started civil disobedience became victims of the transition. So now I try to, 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 to uh, delineate uh, another story about solidarity in present times. The solidarity stripped the elitist conceptual frameworks of its content. Systemic thinking about abrupt social change went in disarray, but regains impetus in the 21st century. To explain, explain it, one must consider outcomes of democratic revolution that accelerates in the times of rapidly growing economic inequalities. Democratic revolution means and um, radicalized the constant and inevitable progress of equality. The insatiable thirst for progress and emancipation was redirected toward the sphere of culture. Uh, the idea of solidarity is written in a specific context, whereby the postmodernist uh, thinking uh, dominates the, the public narrative or public discourse. This kind of kinky thinking directed previously against consensual politics and generally against liberal democracy, democracy has serious consequences in social political practices. It radicalizes politics in the Western so so civilization. So let's take a glimpse upon the politics of difference. It's exclusivist because certain groups, strata, strata are located on the wrong side of history. It begins to exclude, not to include. In this way, the concept of solidarity radically changed its meaning. By a method of social construction adherence to the politics of difference, are able to point out who are expatriates in the contemporary society dominate, dominated by hostile forces. Uh, this new concept of double plurality linked to the principle of difference culminated in that we could call the politics of difference, difference, the democratic 
revolution is endless, enabling to find out the spheres of just injustice are that spheres of justice are numberless. Uh, solidarity with the image of constructing victims frames the social justice. But on the other hand, the dominant agent can at will peg who is oppressed. Such ideological screeds result in a symptom, symptomatic social and cultural screed. And the, now there's a passage from the Jean Baudrillard how to how to create, uh, instead of uh, basic social reality, uh, create uh, uh, image or a myth of the, uh, of the reality. There are four steps, I, I skip over because uh, I have, time is running uh, rapidly out. When the real world uh, at last became a myth, a simulacrum, as Baudrillard's uh, asserts, we are witnessing the death not only of truth and science, but also of common, common sense itself. In, a, in such a way, social constructivists can deny any cumbersome report on reality by creating a liberating myth of equal society, by exposing several, uh, several uh, oppressed uh, minorities. The construction of order is, however, relentless in this pursuit since justice is impossible to achieve. This is the famous test, thesis by one of the uh, philosophers, contemporary, very popular, popular uh, popularized and popular. This pursuit seemingly animated by joyful nihilism, but resentment and violence are swirling underneath. Is in such a social cultural frame possible to bomb up an community? The, the answer is yes, it is. But the result is the fluid community doomed by temporality. A community of contingent members, roles, groups. To put it in one word, it is a flaky community. So it is legitimate to pose a question. Is there any alternative either to democratic liberal practices or utopian visions of the radical democracy? There are several revisions of, uh, ranging from spanning from the Ultima Tula to, 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 to uh, mod, uh, Utopia uh, based upon some, some questions, uh, some uh, topics of equal or uh, egalitarian outcomes. So the emancipators are marching as an avant-garde of the democratic revolution. There are, as they postulate, they are on the right side of historical process. So the Western civilization witnessed several stages of democratic revolution, and I skip over it, but the radical version of equality enforced demands to, to get rid of any form of enslavement uh, by political authority, tradition, manners, habits, prejudice. Equality is defined in all possible vocabulary say for postulates of limiting a growing polarity of poor and rich. It is very interesting from the uh, soci uh, political sociology point of view that uh, uh, many, uh, many uh, emancipators uh, are speaking about emancipation, but uh, emancipation from human nature, gender, manners, but uh, with one exception to the rule, economic disaster stratification. Uh, if we take up some tools provided by political sociology, we can, would find consistent explanation of this strike absence or using postmodern vocabulary and non-presence. All all, almost all progressive movements, ideas, strategies are financed by big money. And progressive's goal is to construct a simulacrum of equality. If you want to understand how it works, Leah Hans Hendrick's foundation, Solidaire, offers a an exemplary case for studying the new concept of solidarity. Now, right now, I offer some conclusions. Uh, I brief, briefly present two approaches to concept of solidarity that constitute completely different social and political practices. Does the original meaning of such concept co solidarity that needs to be based on based on the well-ordered community is foundationalist in its nature? and any referral to the order is essentialist. For seekers of radical solutions, 
such assumptions are of course reactionary and the proponents have obviously to be compartmentalized as fascists. There is no space for them even in public discourse and the new, in the near future a decision to unplug them from the Lebenswelt of, of the new global order seems to be necessary. So those who load it, this will undoubtedly be the elementary act of equity. Thanks to persuasive termin terminology, such a process of naming invites us to the new brave world. The invitation, what is interesting, is formulated in the name of solidarity, equality, and social justice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Giro. Uh, time is running away with us, but I, I think one of the things that particularly struck me from what you said, uh, from my own experience too, is this question of dignity uh, yeah. as, as a profoundly important, indeed an absolutely key value. Uh, certainly when I've seen intractable political violence, whatever the economic differences there have been, and there often are, the sense of unfairness and especially any sense of, uh, of loss of dignity, of humiliation and disrespect, these are profoundly toxic experiences for individuals and, and communities. And I, I thank you for drawing our attention to that. Well, what I'd invite is, is for the three of you perhaps to say something about what has struck you about the, the, uh, the presentations, uh, and of course not forgetting uh, the, the presentation uh, uh, earlier on by, uh, by Austin uh, on, the, on the book Let Us Dream uh, by, by Pope Francis. Um, so I, I'd invite you uh, to, uh, if you would like to indicate, just, just put your hand up. And, uh, and I'll uh, invite each of you to make perhaps a brief uh, contributions before we finish in, in less than 15 minutes now. Uh, Father Michel and, and then Sally. Father Michel. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for, for very interesting and, and compact as well and, and uh, rich presentations I could, I could follow. Uh, I would say that, 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 that you know, I, I kept thinking during, during our meeting uh, about this uh, comparison uh, proposed by uh, Austin uh, between the, the current crisis we are, we are, we are going through and, and the solidarity movement, what, how, to, how to see it together, how to put it together taking into account the experience we are, we, are, we are trying to analyze and to understand a little bit better after 40 years. And I, well, it's, it's just in it, some initial reflections, but they would say that, that each popular movement or each crisis has its momentum, has its momentum. So we, 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 are, we are coming to, to, the, to a moment which may be used to redefine something, to propose something new and so on. And, and this crucial moment needs uh, a good leader, needs in general leadership, a good, le a good leader who is, who is capable, you know, to articulate what we are getting through in a, in a right way. Uh, well, in, in the case of the solidarity movements, I, I took the example of John Paul II uh, because of obvious reasons, I think, but he, he, he wasn't the, the only leader. But, but in general, I would say uh, this, and, and I think that 1987 was, was very special for, for, for as, as such a moment. Uh, it was uh, long enough after, after the beginning, uh, and it, it gave him the time to, 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 to think how to, how to articulate this movement. So I would say that, uh, that, that if we want to, to uh, see the situation today in such terms, the, the biggest challenge we have is leadership. Uh, and and the, uh, as, as well, I would say, uh, our experience is quite is much more complicated because you know it's it's it it will much more black and white uh, to some extent 
in in uh, ethical terms what what we went through in the in the eighties. Um, so so my my first reflection is a little bit on on the leadership. I would say uh, I would integrate as well what what Sally uh, said on um, on I, I, I would describe how solidarity uh, changes makes makes changes inside of our understanding of power responsibility leadership as well so you know subsidiarity as as as, as one of the of the results of, of of social thinking we should we should take into account. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very inspiring to see that, that if we start to think in terms of solidarity, uh, all the games of power, responsibility and leadership must be changed, uh, so, so to say. And, and for example, because of that, there is very some hope that, that we shouldn't be looking for one biggest leader in, in, in the world who will solve all our problems. You know, our, uh, our solving problems process might start uh, as well uh, uh, on the bottom, in the dynamic bottom up, and not only, you know, uh, that, that, that it, it, should, it should start uh, on the top. And, and the last, uh, the second thing I would like to mention is, you know, uh, uh, coming back uh, as well to, to Austin's presentation, because it was uh, so dynamic and, and the first after <laughs> After my presentation, I guess, uh, so, so it, uh, it caught my, my attention. See Judge Act, uh, Francis is, uh, you know, uh, uh, proposal and, and Jesuit proposal as well. Uh, in, and in such a way, Catholic proposal. Uh, uh, I would say that, that my impression is, and I would say that Professor Giro uh, presentation was a very good, uh, full of examples for that, that we have, first of all, the problem today we've seen, we've seen, we've recognized, uh, recognized certain facts that, that, that uh, do not enter uh, what, we, what we want, uh, what we want to see. And, and I, just one example, uh, I would like to show with you is, you know, Orbi, Orbi and Urbi and Orbi uh, blessing of the Pope each year. It started, you know, uh, for me in the, in, uh, in the time of John Paul II, but, you know, I was always astonished at the picture of the world given by, by the Pope in his Urbi and Orbi blessing. And what, how, how, how uh, was it uh, different from our new services, so you know, it was it, it was a different world, and and so, so I would say that one of our challenges, is if if we want, you know, change the inequalities of the world, is is be able, you know, to see, to recognize facts, and 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 confront ourselves with 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 the, with a huge set of facts we don't want to to see uh, in 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 our let's say better side, uh, better part of, of the world, richer part of, of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Father Michael. Professor Sally, you wanted to make an intervention. Yes, just, just a, a small thing. And, um, and you know, so much of our comments uh, focused on solidarity as a reaction, a reaction to injustice or a reaction to, to crisis. And I think it's just important to also understand that solidarity is um, part of the context within which we respond, uh, and, or um, it's also the, the sort of moral relation that we foster um, in times when we're not in crisis. The, um, the, the See Judge Act uh, approach in Catholic social thought has also been paralleled with conversion, communion, and solidarity, and, I, I, and that appears especially in uh, some of the U.S. Catholic bishops' uh, letters on immigration, migration. And I think it's, it's a really helpful uh, way to, to transform the Sea Judge Act for different contexts. Um, conversion requires a, a, a change of heart. And um, in that change of heart, we, we have to see ourselves as culpable, as, as part of the problem. And, and uh, when we react to crisis, it's not just us, them, it's us. It's how, how do we also change so that the crisis 
um, is no, not a crisis, but in our, in our solidarity can be lived out in a genuine way and uh, others can be brought in, which leads to the communion. So, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll stop there, but I um, wanted to mention that. Thank you very much indeed. Professor Tomas, I wonder if I might come to you. Father Michal was, was talking about the question of leadership mm -hmm. and how leadership is immensely important. And yet, the danger of looking to a single leader. Mm -hmm. Of course, the problem at the moment is not so much difficulty of a single leader as the, as the difficulty of almost no leadership at all and no great sense of that. Now, when we talk about, about seeing, um, we, we think of the question of vision, but vision doesn't just mean seeing. Vision means something that takes us beyond what we can see, mm -hmm. actually. And, and while we may not be able to or even wish to have a, a, a single leader because of the problems of that, do you think that there is a problem about, about the vision, about having a vision? Because I, I have the sense that this is one aspect of the problem, too. Uh, uh, after your question, I, uh, I, I recall to my mind uh, Alexis de Tocqueville's uh, remarks about uh, how uh, democracy works. And uh, I think that we are facing the, the one of the phases of the, the democratic process when leadership weakens to some extent, signifying significant extent. I mean that politicians right now are so involved in the day-by-day -day politics that they then they are not capable to able to, to offer any vision because uh, uh, let's say from the uh, 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 etymological point of view, there is a, a present contemporary very popular catchword, walk, walk. Uh, what, what does it mean walk? Uh, to, to, to walk, uh, to, to, to wake up the, 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 uh, the politicians' minds to, to challenges or to, to, to uh, there is any a, a, a problems with the public communications because uh, we we can facing a, a kind of distorted uh, distorted message uh, distorted by social me media message from politicians. So there are uh, two problems. Problems uh, uh, there is a problem of the uh, personality, I would say. Because uh, democracy uh, works in this way that uh, minimizes the, the, the challenge from the, the big personalities. And the second question is, uh, second problem is about the public communication, which is distorted in a significant way by, by uh, uh, no, for example, GAFAM or some other uh, platforms. Thank you very much indeed. Well, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, and I guess what has struck me from listening to the four extremely valuable and thought-provoking presentations is that we are in a curious time because 40 years ago, uh, solidarity meant people coming together against something, um, against a, a, a political structure, against a a way of doing politics, a way of doing governance, um, a sense that there was something that needed to be brought down in, in order that something new might be able to be created. Now we're facing a crisis, which is a crisis that is destroying things. It's destroying lives, it's destroying relationships, it's destroying economies. So it's not a matter of something, a revolution that brings something down. It's the question of whether we have the vision and the leadership to create something new. Uh, and, and I think, I don't think I'm being unfair to say that as young people and indeed older people look around, they don't see a very obvious vision that they can grasp hold of in terms of political theory and ideas, in terms yeah. of economic proposals, structures. In none of these areas do people feel a great sense of inspiration. They don't believe that politicians have the answer, that economists have the answer, that the business world has the answer, that military uh, uh, power has the answer. It seems all of these things have in their own different ways failed. And it does seem to me that it leaves a tremendous opportunity for what one might describe as spiritual vision. 
And, and I think we are seeing elements of that. We've mentioned, of course, Pope Francis. I think it would be fair to say that uh, in the Anglican Communion too, the Archbishop of Canterbury has been a, a, a somewhat inspirational figure. And I'm not without hope that not only in the wider Christian community, uh, the Orthodox community, including those who are under frightful pressure in the Middle East, um, sometimes have important things to say and very, very courageous leaders, but also within other religious communities and indeed those who would not describe themselves as religious, but still have a, a real sense of humanity, of dignity. And, and in that sense, I, I might just say that this is not soft power. In a sense, the search for dignity can be stronger than dynamite if we are able to espouse it with the passion and enthusiasm that it deserves. And I hope that as we, those of us who have participated directly, and those who have been listening in on Zoom and on Facebook, uh, leave this discussion today. They will do so with a sense that this is a time where we desperately need the vision, the passion, and the inspiration that takes us beyond where we are at now. Just yesterday, I was talking with some friends from Peru about how difficult things are there. They're difficult for people in general, they're very difficult for indigenous people, they're difficult for older people, younger people, people in the mountains, people in the cities. These are tough and difficult times, but the challenge may then be not to sit back and relax uh, and be at ease in Zion, because there is no ease in Zion at this time, but rather to be inspired. And I want to thank uh, all four of you, uh, Andreas is not, is not with us now, but uh, uh, Professor Thomas Giro, Father Michal Paluk, and Professor Sally Schultz, thank you very much indeed for the very thoughtful and provocative and encouraging presentations that you've made. It's all going to be available, as these things are nowadays, in a recording, which I'm sure others will want to pick up. And I thank you very much indeed. And can I thank also all those organizations who have come together under Ava's leadership to make this webinar today and indeed to make this series possible because this is the last of the current series, but I'm sure not the last of the webinars that we will be doing together. Thank you very much indeed to all of you for an excellent afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.